All right, welcome back to the Copywriters Podcast with your host, the world's greatest copywriting coach, David Garfinkel. David, how are you doing today, man? Nathan, I'm good. How are you? I'm doing fantastic, and we're returning to what I found out is not only my favorite series. I'm hearing a lot of people saying that this is their favorite series on the Copywriters Podcast, and I know that you know a little bit more about that, but uh, I'm, I'm stoked to be here today. Yeah, I... I heard from somebody over across the pond in the UK who's actually having me on his show. And he said, yeah, I like those. It's like you're walking on the beach with one of those finders. And when you find something, your eyes light up. And so I think that's what those are like for him. So, mm. yeah, here we go. It's like the the metal detector and every... Metal detector. Actually, yeah. very frequently, we have these golden nuggets that show up in the podcast. Speaking of golden nuggets, today we are actually back with a gold edition of the Copywriters Podcast, a special one, and that's because we're taking a deep dive into the gold mines of copywriting history. The two men who invented copywriting as we know it, and the man who hired them, and those two men who invented copywriting are Claude Hopkins and Johnny Kennedy. The man who hired them was Albert Lasker. And I'll tell you more about all of them uh, in a minute. I came across this book, The Man Who Sold America, which has information I had never seen anywhere else before. Uh, that was probably because one of the authors, Arthur Schultz, is the former CEO of the ad agency Footcone and Belding. And with that job, that position gave him and his co-author, Jeffrey L. Creekshank, access to private papers and other information that was not available to anyone else. You see, Footcone and Belding used to be Lord and Thomas, and that was the agency that way back in the day, Albert Lasker ran when he hired Claude Hopkins and Johnny Kennedy. And I probably never would have even known about this book if I hadn't been told about it by Brad Nickel, one of my mentoring clients and a previous guest on Copywriters Podcast. So thanks, Brad, for letting me know about it. Now, it's a big book. So I've selected just a handful of key highlights from the more than 400 pages that go deep into Lasker's life and his experience with two copywriters. But first, Here's something that I know for many of you is one of the greatest highlights ever of this podcast. Copy is powerful. You're responsible for how you use what you hear on this podcast. And most of the time, common sense is all you need. But if you make extreme claims and or if you're writing copy for offers in highly regulated industries like health, finance, and business opportunity, you may want to get a legal review after you write and before you start using your copy. My larger clients do this all the time. Okay, here's what happens next. This podcast contains three sections, and each section is focused on one person. First, Albert Lasker, then Johnny Kennedy, and last, Claude Hopkins. We'll look at how their lives and careers intertwined I think it's very interesting that all three of them got to where they were and did what they did through some personal connections. In the case of Kennedy, it was a personal connection that he proactively created himself. And now, let's take a trip down the copywriting time tunnel to the late 1800s and hop on over to Galveston, Texas. Galveston, oh Galveston. Albert Lasker grew up in Galveston, at the time the largest city in Texas. His father was very entrepreneurial, very successful, and a major influence in Albert's life. But it was not an entirely happy childhood. His father could be pretty severe and strict, and Albert grew to fear his dad as much as desperately want to earn his approval. Oh, wait, where have we heard that before? There were more early hints. In 1892, Albert entered high school. Overall, he found it boring. But when he was put in an economics class, he took the textbook home and read it cover to cover in one night. And 
There were more early hints that Lasker was headed for big things in business. In 1893, the next year, he founded and edited a school magazine. One of the first things he did was go to downtown Galveston and sell ads to the businesses for the magazine. He was restless. He only stayed with the magazine for one semester, and then he turned it over to another student. He had bigger things in mind. Still in high school, Lasker charmed his way into working for the town newspaper, the Galveston Daily News. He took a side hustle, collecting testimonials for the Peruna Company, which made patent medicines, and he got $5 for each one. $5 in 1893, 1894, which would be about $150 in 2021 money for each testimonial. Not bad for a high school kid, right? Mm. He was also very aggressive and enterprising as a news reporter. However, his stern father would not allow Albert to become a news reporter as a career. Because as a prominent businessman, Morris, the dad, held journalism in very low esteem. He didn't know enough about advertising at the time to think poorly of it, however. And you'll see what I'm talking about in a minute. Now, Morris had a connection, Morris in Texas, in Galveston, Texas, had a connection in Chicago with the ad agency Lord and Thomas. Um, Morris got Albert a job there. He figured anything to keep his son Albert away from the seedy life of journalism. Albert arrived in Chicago a few days just after his 18th birthday in 1898. Lord and Thomas had its offices in the Trudy Building at the corner of North Wabash Avenue and East Randolph Street. And that's about eight-tenths of a mile south of where I worked when I lived in Chicago for McGraw-Hill on Michigan and Erie, and that was 40 years ago. But back to 1898. Previously, advertising also had had a terrible reputation, just as journalism did, and maybe the only reason Morris didn't try to stop Albert from working in advertising was he knew almost nothing about it. But people more familiar with advertising associated it with patent medicine vendors and circuses. Nothing so-called respectable like washers and carpet sweepers, as we'll see a little later on. And that's not to say that the companies who made those washers and sweepers weren't advertising. It's just at the time, the reputation of advertising was focused on things that people considered sleazy. But all that was about to change right about the time Albert came to Chicago, and it was going to change in a fast and a big way. A number of factors were coming together rapidly at the end of the 1800s to make advertising much more socially acceptable, especially the growth of manufacturing, the expansion of railroads, and the rapid expansion of retail and mail order stores. Not only that, in the late 1800s, business-wise, Chicago was ground zero. It was the center of the American commercial universe at that time. Plus, on the national front, there was a growing number of magazines. When you look at the combined circulation of the national magazines, the overall number increased tenfold from 1860 to 1900. Very fast growth rate. So together, all these things, the manufacturing, the railroads, um, the retail stores, the magazines, the mail order business, they made Chicago the right place and the right time for Albert Lasker to meet his destiny, to create advertising as we know it today in 2021. There was one more thing, money. Ad agencies get paid, at least in part and sometimes in full, based on a portion of what a magazine or a newspaper or a TV network or a digital network sells the ad to the advertiser for. So, say, on a $100,000 buy today, an agency might get $15,000, $15,000 each time the ad runs. But again, back to Lasker. Advertising rates were skyrocketing. In 1883, a one-page ad in the Ladies' Home Journal went for $200, 200. Ten years later, in 1893, the same ad sold for $4,000, 20 times as much, 2,000% growth in 10 years. 
In the late 1800s, the ad agencies didn't actually produce the ads. They just acted like commissioned salespeople for magazine space, selling it to advertisers. When Lasker started working at Lord & Thomas, there was one graphic artist and a halftime writer working there. The writer spent half of his day working for the ad agency and the other half of his day working for Montgomery Ward, a big Chicago mail order company. When his dad, Morris, came to visit 18 months after Albert had started in 1899, Ambrose Thomas, the Thomas of Lord and Thomas, told Morris that Albert was either a genius or crazy. Hmm, where have we heard that before? <laughs> Lasker developed the copy department and Lord and Thomas for his own purposes. He realized that he and the agency could grow much faster if they produced and sold the work for the actual ads rather than just brokered the ad space. He did an experiment with a hearing aid company where he co-wrote the copy along with an old newspaper friend. The campaign worked and Lasker managed to increase Lord and Thomas's annual fees from the hearing aid company from $1,400 a year to $10,800 a year. That's more than a sevenfold increase because he and a co-writer had come up with a copy that worked. Over time, Lasker built up a team of six full-time copywriters at the agency. He was in charge of them and he was responsible for their results. This led him, and this is really important, this led him into a frantic search to find the answer to a very simple question. What is advertising? Um, before we go on to the next section, Nathan, any thoughts about Albert Lasker? No, I'm just intrigued by that whole time period and the evolution of what advertising was before then and then what advertising came into being. I, I just kind of want to nail home how pivotal that moment in time was for what we do. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, a lot of people who have only lived in a digital world and live a lot of their lives on screens kind of might think that, you know, history began with the invention of the iPhone. Uh, no, not, not true, actually. Hopefully we're demonstrating that today. And that's a really good point. I'm glad you mentioned, I'm glad you said what you said. But let's go to our next section now, which is about Johnny Kennedy. So remember, at this point, there was no clear definition and Lasker was obsessed with the question, what is advertising? This would eventually lead him to meeting copywriter Johnny Kennedy, but not at first. Lasker got a lot of unsatisfactory answers to his question in the beginning. He wrote a letter to his father shortly after he arrived in Chicago, admitting he was troubled by not knowing. So he asked his bosses, at Lord and Thomas, what advertising was. And they sometimes found him amusing and sometimes annoying, but they were never able to give Lasker an answer that satisfied him. Lasker asked his competitors, other ad agency execs. No luck there, just a bunch of platitudes, which after all is another word for socially acceptable bullshit. Lasker remained frustrated and annoyed because no one could give him a logical answer to his question. Now, a good question for us to ask at this point is, why was he so obsessed with this question? After all, this was not a philosophy student going down the rabbit trail of asking everyone in sight how many angels you could fit on the head of a pin. There were practical business reasons Lasker wanted to know. And there was this. If you don't know what something is, how can you make it better consistently? How can you sell more of it? How can you make more money for your clients with it if you don't know what it is? Lasker figured if he could get the answer and put it in a reliable system, then he could make a fortune. He did get an answer eventually. He put it into a reliable system fairly quickly and he did make a fortune. Some people in a position to know have said Albert Lasker made more money in advertising than anyone else ever has or will. 
I don't know if that is strictly true, but he did make a ton of money. When he retired in 1942, we're jumping ahead in time for a second here. When he retired in 1942, he was paying himself $1 million a year. And in today's terms, that would be about $16 million a year. But back to the question, what is advertising? The early answers were frustrating. The first thing he concluded after doing a lot of research and talking to a lot of people was that advertising was sloganizing, or as we could say today, advertising is branding. Well, some people still think that, but a business that wants to grow needs more than a good slogan. Another thing that was partially true, but not satisfying, advertising was news. Lasker was making quite a reputation for himself everywhere he went, always asking, always asking, what is advertising? One day in May 1904, about six in the evening, Lasker was in the office talking with his boss when a bellboy appeared with a note. The bellboy gave it to Lasker's boss, Mr. Thomas. The old man looked at the note, laughed, and he slid it across the desk to young Lasker. This was the note Lasker had been waiting for for six years, and here's what it said. I am in the saloon downstairs. I can tell you what advertising is. I know you don't know. It will mean much to me to have you know, and it will mean much to you. If you wish to know what advertising is, send the word yes down by the bellboy. Signed, Johnny Kennedy. Now, before we get to what happened next, which a lot of listeners and viewers already know, let's think about that note for a second. Is it not a sales pitch with a hard card closed in writing? If you want this, say yes. I think it is. Now, of course, the answer Kennedy finally gave was salesmanship in print, which he had just demonstrated with the note. And I'd like to point something else out, too. Previously on Copywriter's Podcast, copywriting historian Sean Vosler noted that others had come up with the same definition long before Kennedy's meeting with Lasker. And I believe Sean is right. He's done the research and he's very thorough. But as copywriting podcaster David Garfinkel, I'd like to point out that about half a dozen other people discovered or invented radio at the same time as Guglielmo Marconi, and Marconi shared a Nobel Prize for it in 1909. In history, Marconi pretty much gets all the credit. So what does that mean? Part of getting the credit, I think, is being in the right place at the right time and having the good luck to be able to do something about it. And that was Kennedy. After the meeting in the saloon, some hard-headed negotiation followed, and Kennedy, besides writing copy, ended up giving Lasker one-on-one -on -one copywriting lessons for a year, lessons that Lasker lapped up like a thirsty dog. These lessons ended up in a series of essays you can find on the internet today in a book called Reason Why Copy. Kennedy and Lasker took on the account for a business called 1900 Washer Company, which, as you would expect, sold clothes washers. They weren't exactly washing machines the way we know them today. When this company came to Lord & Thomas, 1900's ads weren't working. After what these two copywriters did, sales increased sixfold in four months. Lasker was astonished by what writing was like for Kennedy. Lasker later told a writer named Boyden Sparks, he had to think everything out laboriously with labored pains. I imagine he corrected an advertisement 25 to 50 times before he would release it. Lasker said that to write the first ad of a campaign might take Kennedy a month or six weeks. But great copywriters are like that sometimes. The key thing to remember is, over these long stretches of time, mostly Kennedy was working, refining, thinking, arguing with himself in his own mind, 
before coming to final copy. But Kennedy's ads worked. As I mentioned, 1900's sales increased 600% in four months. A star was born, or maybe, as it turned out, a meteor, because Kennedy was more like a shooting star. He burned bright, but he flamed out after two years and left Lord and Thomas in 1906. Nathan, any thoughts on Johnny Kennedy before we move on? I just have to make a correction. I actually heard that story before. That was when I first got into copywriting. I think a book that Ray Edwards wrote starts off with that story. So I have heard of Laskin. Is that his name? Lasker. Lasker. I have heard of Lasker. I just was not able to draw the connection until halfway through that story. I was like, oh, yeah, I've heard this before. And um, the whole salesmanship, salesmanship in print is like the difference between direct response advertising and uh, I guess the reminder type advertising that I think was prominent at the time. So again, just going back to how much of a impact that moment in time made on what we do. Yeah. Um, yeah. R really good point. I mean, Lasker isn't as well known because he, he was like the producer or the director or the, you know, the, board of directors, the CEO. I mean, he stayed in the background. He wasn't the, he wasn't the Ron Popeil. He wasn't the front guy, you know, the, these guys, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't even have a book. In fact, um, the quote I was reading from that writer about um, Kennedy from Lasker, uh, Lasker hired this writer to, ghostwrite his autobiography but never got finished he he was a very public person but not in advertising in the way that these other guys were I mean, he went on uh, i think it was the u.s shipping board he got into politics he did all kinds of things but um set up a foundation all kinds of stuff but never never got known the way these two guys do but all right let's get to the next one because now we come to the part about claude hopkins which of these three, I think more people have heard of, almost everybody's heard of Claude Hopkins. So remember, Kennedy came, made a lot of noise, fomented a lot of change, and then he left. He went from Chicago to New York. When Kennedy left, it created a problem for Lord and Thomas, and it created a problem for Lasker in particular. A major account that the agency had, Van Camp Packing Company, told Lasker they wanted a copywriter as good as Kennedy, who had been working for Van Camp Kennedy had until he left. For Van Camp, Kennedy had come up with this headline for their condensed milk. Now a cow in your pantry. Don't laugh. This was 1904. Revolutionary idea. It worked at the time. The campaign Kennedy wrote quickly expanded Van Camp's market share in condensed milk and pushed their product up to become the number one bestseller. But now, in 1906, Kennedy was gone. And Lasker was worried. Van Camp wanted a copywriter nearly as good as Kennedy, and Lasker didn't know any copywriter nearly as good as Kennedy, or even know of such a person, for that matter. One day, Lasker was on a train when he ran into a magazine publisher he knew, Cyrus Curtis. The magazine's publisher knew advertising very well, and he opened up a magazine, not one of his own. He pointed to an ad for Schlitz beer, and it had to be someone else's magazine he was reading at the time because Curtis had banned the words wine and beer from his own magazines. Hmm. Curtis told Lasker to find the man who had written the Schlitz ad and to hire him. In fact, Curtis said the ad was so good that he was actually going to order a Schlitz himself, which was all the more remarkable be Curtis, because Curtis almost never drank alcohol himself. The writer of the Schlitz ad, of course, turned out to be Claude Hopkins. We're in 1907 now. Um, to call Hopkins a workaholic would be an understatement. Years later, in his book, My Life in Advertising, Claude Hopkins wrote, if I have gone higher than others in advertising or done more, 
The fact is not due to exceptional ability, but to exceptional hours. It means that a man has sacrificed all else to exceed in this one profession. It means a man to be pitied, perhaps, rather than envied, perhaps. He wasn't kidding, either. Hopkins had been very poor as a child. He never wanted to go back to poverty again, so he regularly worked 12 hours a day, seven days a week. That's 84 hours a week instead of 40 or 30 or 20. At age 17, this is a long time ago, before even 1907, in 1883, at age 17, Hopkins had gotten a job in the bookkeeping department of the Bissell Carpet Sweeper Company in Western Michigan. And this, this is 24 years before he met Lasker. This is when he got his first chance to write advertising, but it was on his own initiative. He offered to rewrite a brochure for Bissell on his own time after work hours. Remember, he was a bookkeeper at the time. His bosses liked the rewrite he did, then he started coming up with ways to increase sales. One idea he talked the company into was trying to offer its carpet sweepers with 12 special woods, 12 different versions of the carpet sweeper, each one with a special, different special wood. And he created a campaign that sold 250,000 of these sweepers in three weeks. Fast forward to 1907 when Hopkins met Lasker at a lunch one of Lasker's friends arranged for them both. Hopkins and Lasker made a deal and Hopkins was to be paid $1,000 a week or $52,000 a year, which in 2021 dollars is a little more than $1.5 million a year, an unheard of salary for a copywriter at that time. Hopkins didn't need the money. He had a net worth of about $30 million in today's dollars. He had been basically retired. So Lasker needed a way to get Hopkins' attention. And the outrageous salary of $1,000 a week seemed to do the trick. Hopkins did not let any grass grow. His first day on the job, Hopkins began teaching the other copywriters at Lord & Thomas. He taught them things like, don't brag or beg in your copy. Instead, find a way, always, to appeal to a customer's self-interest. Don't look at the market as a crowd. See the market as a collection of individuals. Later, in the book My Life in Advertising, Hopkins explained his philosophy this way. We must get down to individuals. We must treat people in advertising as we treat them in person. Even though he became the master of this with the written word, in his personal life, he was not exactly a social butterfly, not when it came to real live people. This from a eulogy decades after he first came to Lord and Thomas. The eulogy, of course, was given after Hopkins died. Hopkins was always difficult in conversations. His intimacies were few. In many ways, he was Lasker's opposite. Whereas Lasker was versatile, Hopkins was single-traced. His one subject was advertising copy for music, books, politics, sports, plays, personalities, and skateboarding. He had very little concern. Uh, okay, I threw in that thing about skateboarding just for fun, but everything else was the actual eulogy. So... Nathan, that wraps up our deep dive into the old masters of copywriting goldmine. We have taken a look at the two copywriters who changed everything, Claude Hopkins and Johnny Kennedy, and the man who hired them, Albert D. Lasker. And here's the book, The Man Who Sold America, by Jeffrey L. Cruikshank and Arthur W. Schultz, and we can put a link in the show notes for that. I just want to touch on one thing that you mentioned everybody knows claude hopkins for scientific advertising but and this is just a personal opinion of mine uh my life in advertising which was the other book that he wrote 
in my opinion, I like it. I, I found it a more enjoyable read. It's more personal. It goes through what he was going through in his mind as he came up with some of his best campaigns. And so if you've only read scientific advertising and you haven't read my life in advertising, I would say pick it up because it's in probably my top five marketing and copywriting books ever, just because there's a wealth of knowledge and it's not laid out as an instruction manual. Like a lot of copywriting books are, it's laid out as a, this is what I was going through in my life. This is what led me to have these sparks of creation. And I, for the right type of mindset, I think there's a lot more in that than some of the other copywriting instructional books out there. So I'm glad that you mentioned it because it's one of those books by, especially by him that goes unnoticed because it's overshadowed by scientific advertising. Yeah, that's a great point. It really is a good book. Um, and since so much of copywriting is doing our best to simulate getting inside other people's minds um here's hopkins laying his wide open for you to yeah. see if you can learn to think a little more that way it's only going to help you and the man who sold america we'll make sure to have that in the show notes for this episode if you want to check out the show notes you can always find those over at copywriterspodcast.com anything else before we're out of here david no that's it all right. Awesome. Thank you for bringing this to our attention today and I will catch you later. Okay, great. Catch you later. Thank you.